is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Golden Sun, chapters 49, 50, and 51, Why We Sing, The Deep, and Golden Sun. In these chapters, I am so upset. If you are finding this after the fact, I posted some videos to ye old TikTok, which maybe TikTok will no longer be there by the time this airs. <laughs> but uh, I was not ready for any of this, and I am not ready for the next book. <laughs> Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. <laughs> Thank you very much to Alex for commissioning this episode. I guess. <laughs> Y'all. <sighs> okay. So, you know, I do have to talk about the two chapters that come before it. And I will. Of course I will. But first, we, we, ha I mean, come on, what am I going to not start with that? Like, I had my suspicions about the vibe that I was getting from the jackal. I don't know if I was right in the scene that I was talking about this in. Because I don't know, like, how he got this information about Darrow. I'm thinking that they simply did not save the other members of the Sons in time. And that those people did give up information. And by the time they were rescued, they said they didn't. But it had happened. And it was too late to undo it. And the damage was done. And the Jackal was just sitting on that information. I have also thought about where Darrow was when he told his story to Mustang and whether that was a factor. I still never thought it was going where it was going. And forgive me if you have watched the TikToks and heard this already. But when I tell you that I was sitting stock still in my living room, staring into space, listening to the last 15 minutes of this audiobook, with my mouth open, gasping intermittently, and angrily saying, I knew it, I do not exaggerate at all. And I had to turn the book off after it was over. And, and just watch TV with Owen and not talk about what I had just read to anybody. That's why I recorded the TikTok because I was like losing my mind. And then go to bed. And I was just thinking this chapter over. And I woke up anxious about the chapter because it was so... It was such a burn it all to the ground sort of approach that it never occurred to me we would be here at the, like, not this quick. You know, I figure eventually Darrow's cover is going to be blown. Eventually something's going to happen to the leader of the cause, Fitchner. I figure that. I'm expecting that in like the second to last book, maybe even the last book. I'm not expecting it just after Darrow has found out who everybody is. And 
I really thought I, I, you guys know that I had my suspicions about Roke and just felt a way about him. I had been feeling a way about him, but I also kind of wondered if he had been let in on the secret, maybe things would have like he, because he was such a philosopher that maybe he could understand. And it turns out not only is that, or was the response that Severo had correct? But he asked, I, you guys, show of hands. When Augustus is talking to Darrow and says, my son gave me his blessing to adopt you, who else went, oh, did he? Because that was the moment I knew shit was really bad. As soon as he said, I talked to him and he gave his blessing, I was like, oh, God. Like, it just, I knew that shit was about to go quite left. I wasn't sure if it would immediately, and I didn't expect it to be what it was. But I was already like, fucking no. And then... There's the mention of how Roke insisted on presenting him this mask. And I was very much like, did he now? Huh? Like, I did not like that at all. Roke, I'm already just not really trusting at this point. And I just couldn't imagine why he would want to be part of this particular ceremony in that capacity. It felt weird. And then when the ceremony is about to begin and Roke walks up and it's described as an ivory box large enough to fit the victory mask in or whatever the mask is called, I immediately went, oh, fuck, somebody's head is in that fucking box. Like I fucking knew there was not a mask in that box. But I'll tell you what I thought. I thought it was going to be Mustang. That's what I thought. I thought Roke was so livid still about Quinn that he was going to have killed Mustang to try and get back at him and that he had gotten Adrius's approval to do it because now they were like this. I was thinking way too small. It never even occurred to me that the whole jig was up. And at first, things are unraveled very slowly. Like, it's very fast, really. But as you're reading it, it feels this, like, inexorable sense of dread because you know fucking something is wrong. And they open the box and he says how his whole world falls apart. And I'm like, oh, my God, it's Mustang. But then a moment later, Cassius is here. And I think it's Severo who's, or not Severo, it's uh, the Jackal who's saying, like, you can't kill him, you know what the Sovereign said. And he says dissection. And that was when I was like, no. Like, for a moment, for a moment, I tried to tell myself dissection in, in that she wants to pull him apart, that she wants to torture him to death because of what he did. But I, I knew that wasn't why. That's not how it would be worded. It didn't work. And then Roke, well, for Cassius says all of the names of these different people and says they deserved better than to die because of a slave, like following a slave. And then I was like, oh, my God. And then Roke saying, you and I are not brothers. You are a son of red. I am a son of gold. The time of us being brothers is over. And I was like, whoa, whoa. so wait, so now what? Still thinking that it's Mustang's head in the box. But somebody asks where Mustang is. And finally, Adrius has to be like, apparently they had a fucking little fight and she's not here, which is very annoying. And I immediately went, oh, my God, wait, what? 
So if she's not, if she's not here, then who is that? And when it said that it was Fitchner, I like completely lost my mind. Severo and Ragnar have been sent away, right? They were sent to find Fitchner because r- the whole thing was that Severo didn't understand why he wasn't responding. I knew he was likely not responding for a very, very bad reason, but I didn't think it was because he was fucking dead. So when Severo left with Ragnar, my reaction was, I cannot believe you are alone right now down there, Darrow. I can't believe you don't have any of your like number one people beside you in this crowd. I felt like this was a stupid move. But now I am so glad because there is no fucking way with all of them gathered around that he that they wouldn't all have just been taken down at the same time. I mean, Darrow could have. There's a possibility Ragnar could have done some damage, but I just don't think with the way this was set up, they would have been able to manage him in the end. So my only consolation is that Mustang and Severo and the Telemannises are still out there. And I have no idea whether the Telemannises are on his side because now that this thing has been revealed, I am assuming that this whole takeover coup has been transmitted somehow, that people have seen it. Now, I may be wrong about that. It, it may have been something that they wanted to sort of like get done under the radar and then the sovereign would simply come forward and be like, hey, bitches, you thought you got rid of me. But at this point, I'm sort of like thinking – you built up that Darrow was practically immortal on all of your news networks. And now you have to show that you took him down the way you took him down, because that feels like the ultimate, you know? And if this has been broadcast, it's going to be, everybody is going to know what he really is. And I have no real idea. I want to believe the Telemannuses would have his back anyway. I want to believe that so bad, you guys. I really do. And I just can't bank on that because, you know, like, how can I? And I, I, I almost feel like when they find out that Pax died for this guy who was a fucking red, that will be worse. So... I can't, I, 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 it all depends on whether this info is made public and I have to assume it was made public. I have to, it just doesn't make sense that everybody wouldn't know. And that's the part that I genuinely do not know where we go from here. That's what I said in my TikToks about how like unsettled this chapter left me because I have read books where shit has really gone down and there has been a sort of complete dynamic shift in the direction I thought the plot was going because of something that was really dramatic that changed all of a sudden. I have read that. But even within those kinds of major shifts, things still sort of fell within like the parameters of allowed damage, you know? It just feels like all of the damage I was expecting to come later got packed into one book. And the fact that Darrow's like cover is blown now, there I would have previously been like, well, what is this? Like, how is Augustus? And Augustus is dead now. Like, he's just such a non-factor. I wonder if this reveal will like am i still thinking too small i'm over here like mustang and Severo and the telemannuses because they're the golds but what if that's not the fucking like group that he needs to worry about and depend on anymore 
what if he has made it known who he's fighting for so publicly that when people see him go down like this, that's what spurs everything on. Like his wife dying was the beginning. It was the spark. Maybe if this is shown, it will be what really gets things rolling. And that's the only reason that I could see to not televise it in the way that I have been expecting it was. I really can't decide whether or not it would be a big enough risk in the eyes of Adrius to do it. Because I feel like I don't know if Adrius has a good grasp on how much real upheaval there has been and how much there will be like people flocking to try and help him. I I think people will. But I could also be overestimating them. They there you know there is an ingrained training and they are bred for a specific purpose, these different races. And I can't tell whether my hopes for this are over ambitious and they actually are too beaten down to rise up that way. Or if Adrius would underestimate them, if he would really think now that we've killed Fitchner and taken you, that's a wrap on that. Like, I, I just, like, this is, I, I really feel like I have been thrown into the deep end. I have no idea where we go. When we open the next book, is he going to be being tortured? Is it going to be like, we're already in the middle of that? Because I just really want to mention that Pierce Brown he is not averse to really putting Darrow through it. Darrow has been injured to near death a lot of times. And what I really like about the writing is that he never makes it feel like here we are again. It always feels like maybe Darrow could die, even though I know he won't. That possibility feels very real in a way that I don't really know why it always feels so real when I am aware there are four more books. You know what I'm saying? Like, why is it that I am always genuinely worried? And I think it's simply like the sheer level of damage that is allowed to be done to him short of actually killing him has been so severe and so humiliating that even if he gets out of wherever he goes, I'm just worried about what I'm going to have to see before he gets out because I assume he will and I don't want that and what are other people going to have to risk to get him out and how is he going to respond to being at the mercy of these people I I just there, there I have no idea or the next book could start literally right here and he's still on the ground, paralyzed, and they're doing their thing. And it starts like exactly where we left off, which is also possible. We also could kind of jump ahead. And I I don't know why we would, but there's like, I, this is what I mean. I feel like I usually have a pretty good sense and I just don't. I feel like if you're going to do this and blow it up like this, anything goes. It's a complete like, and I really want to know what Pierce Brown, there's, there's an acknowledgement at the end of the book where he's talking about somebody and he's like, readers can thank him for the high kill count and the like the unrelenting pace, something like that. There was somebody who was really telling him to like, you know, cut out this, cut out that, and just really keep it going. And I can't help but wonder, did he intend for this to be later also? And the person he was like having be a beta reader was sort of like, you should do it now. That would fuck people up. Just go ahead, do it now. 
uh, whoever it is, and if it was their idea, give them a raise because this was so shocking and so devastating. It was so devastating, you guys. It really, truly was. It's it's like you just feel like he has really gotten to this point that he's practically untouchable. You know, he's about to be adopted by Augustus, who's about to be sovereign. He's made a deal with Fitchner that he's going to be in constant contact while he's doing his operations. It really feels like we are being set up to go into the next book in a position of great power. And even though I really felt like we've got to watch out for the Jackal, man, I feel like you're not paying enough attention to him. I thought a betrayal that was going to happen was going to come from Roke and Roke only and be kind of minor and personal. And that was going to be what we dealt with. This is so much more dramatic than that. And I, I know I've just kind of like rambled here for 25 minutes and I'm sorry, but this is what you're paying me for, I guess. So I hope that's what you want. <laughs> um, Alex says, I remember reading it and just gasping audibly. Oh my God, you guys gasping over and over again, over and over again. When, when we have the jackal there and he's doing something on his keypad and Daryl's like, everything okay? And he's like, oh, yeah, just these fucking work orders. And I was like, no, it's not. No, it's not. What is he doing? What is he doing, though? And then the fact that there's somebody in the audience that's supposed to be a pink, but they're sort of not acting like one. And it seems like they're familiar. And I was like, oh, shit. Oh, shit. Who's that? Like, I'm just on edge, right? So I'm just hyped. And then we have the opening of the box and my world falls apart. And that was when I said, I fucking knew it out loud and stopped Owen dead in his tracks because he was like, what is happening? But then you have him being hit with the, the spike. I'm pointing to my neck, but it wasn't in his neck. It was like on his hand because Roke was holding his hand, I think. With, and he does it with his ring. And then you have Cassius turning up. And I gasped when it, I found out it was Cassius standing right there. Because for some reason, I was like, sure, Adrius would turn on him. But he wouldn't pair up with the Bolognas. He would never do that. Turns out, oh, yeah, he would. So gasped on that. Gasped when he said dissection. They deserved better than to die for a slave. Gasped when... It's revealed whose head is in the box. It was just like over and over and over me just like saying, oh, my God. Oh, no, 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 no. Like chanting to myself. It was endless. It just felt like the the dread. I thought we had hit our crescendo and that there was the release of its Mustang's head in the box. And instead... It was nothing like what I thought. And it just, there were so many pieces still to fall into place. So many like points that he had to connect. And when I tell you that I saw that, like I heard him say, I look in the box and my, you know, my world falls apart. And then I look and I see that there's like 12 minutes left in the audiobook. I was like, hold on 12 minutes. Like, cause me gasping out loud at that point and saying I fucking knew it and Owen's standing there. He's waiting for me to stop my, my audio book so that I can watch television with him and eat dinner. And I had to be like, babe, I paused it for like a second. And I said, I am so sorry. I cannot stop right now. 10 minutes. And he was like, okay. And then I turned it back on and utterly ignored him for another 10 minutes. So it, it was just, you guys, it was just so much. It was so much. Um, Cassie says, ramble on. Alex says, so here then, which was more the shock to your system? This ending or the red wedding? <sighs> this ending. This ending. The red wedding was a huge shock. Don't get me wrong. It was such a shock. I will never forget. I was. It was like 2 a.m. I could not put the book down. And I was reading it on a Kindle. And I threw the Kindle across the room. And I put a hole in the drywall. Because I was so pissed. I will never forget that. But 
there there had already been such shocking deaths in that series that a part of me kind of was like, yeah, you know what I mean? Like this feels new. He hadn't done this yet. He has been willing to kill people and there have been brutal deaths and tortures and whatnot, but this isn't like the way he has operated. It hasn't felt that way to me. And so I wasn't prepared in the way the previous books kind of prepared me for the Red Wedding. And I will, st I will still say I wasn't prepared for the Red Wedding either, but I felt at least slightly less surprised. Um, Cassie says, remember Lauren's words? They haven't made a man that can kill old Stoneside. I didn't remember those words, but yeah, that's, and that's what fucking Adria says as he stabs him. They were wrong. Your sides aren't made of stone at all. I can't because like Lorne dying and it's not just like this whole thing was to save his grandchildren who I think are there, if I'm not mistaken. So they're dead, you know, like this is really, this is real bad. So, all right, now, now I'm going to back up and start with chapter 49, which has the first sentence. I've never felt fear like this, which is hilarious because he has no idea. And what it turns out he's doing is leading Mustang to his family home. And she notices that he's navigating the place with no problem and says, how do you know where we're going? And he says, you told me to let you in. How far do you want to go? She says all the way. So he hands her a hollow cube and leaves her outside and says, after you watch that, you can come in. But if you don't come in, I understand. And he goes in and his mother knows who he is. I loved this because I wasn't sure. And I feel like there are mothers out there who would say, like, no matter how much my kid has changed, I would know who they were. Like, it's just, it's not even about how they look exactly, you know? And it turns out that she has had a stroke. She's got one side of her face is like sort of fallen and her speech is slurred and her movements are a little bit like less sure. Um, and he's too big to like sit on one of their chairs. So he has to sit on the ground. Um, and this, you guys, the, the meaning between the two of them, I really enjoyed, even though it's very short lived, but I had so much anxiety over him doing this. Like it just felt my, my paranoia has been ever since finding out that there is there was a recording device that was small enough to fit like between his teeth or whatever it was. Ever since finding that out, I have wondered, is there any guarantee at any time that he isn't being bugged or there isn't somebody watching? It has just felt so possible that there is surveillance at any given moment. And just the risk of coming down here felt like way too much to me. So he looks at his data pad, wondering if Mustang has come, is going to come in, but it says that she's heading back to the ship and he's getting a message from Severo that says, stop her. Basically, do you want me to shoot her? Because now she knows and she's apparently turning her back on you. And he decides to let her make her choice. He's trying to trust her, which I really appreciate because he didn't in the first book. There was a whole moment where it looked bad for her. Like she was in with her brother and he assumed the worst and it didn't really bite him in the ass too bad, but she definitely wasn't happy that it seemed like he hadn't believed in her 
And I was sort of like, I would really like to believe you've grown a little since then and that you're not going to like assume the same thing. So she, he is letting her go and sort of think things over. Of course, everybody else, I bet, was sort of like, wrong choice, dude, but I get it. Um, and there's some interesting conversation with his mother. Like, she mentions his accent and how funny he sounds. And then it turns out she knew he was alive because Nero told her. But he didn't tell her what had happened to him. And she says something about the revolution that he's attempting to start. And she says, like, what do you want us to do? Go up there? And the way she says it is like she knows that it's terraformed and ready. She's not under the same, like, misunderstanding. I hate to use that word. That's not the word I want. But you know what I'm saying. She isn't operating with the same info that Darrow was when he was down there. Um, and she says, uh, your, f your father's brother fell down a mine shaft with Lauren. And as soon as she said that, I'm like, that fucker's alive. And I love the, m the next like paragraph is her going, yeah, he's not fucking dead. I'll believe him when I see a body. And I was like, good for you, lady. She's not a fool. Um, I think he left this place and took Lauren with him. What of Kieran, Liana, Dio? Your sister's remarried, lives with her husband in Gamma Township. Gamma? I sneer. You let her... I stop as soon as I see the fresh twist in my mother's mouth. I might wear the trappings of a gold, but I better shut the hell up about her daughter. And I was like, yeah, that's right. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> She's got two girls that look more like you than her or any Gamma I've ever seen. And Kieran's well. You'd be right proud of him. Not the sniveling child you might remember squabbing up his chores and talking in his sleep. Man of the house. Head talk for the crew after Nero slipped down. Diona, his wife, died in childbirth, though. He took another a few months back. Damn. That is a lot happening. Um, Dio, who is... Uh, let's see. What of Dio, Eo's parents... Her father is dead, killed himself not long after you tried the same. Yikes. Um, but Dio's well, she's upstairs. Did she marry Kieran? Aye, and she's pregnant. I'm hoping for a girl, but with my luck, it'll be a boy who wants to dodge pit vipers and steam burns his whole life. And then she talks about how they're worried because the mines seem to be sort of drying up. And he's like, nothing's going to happen to you because I'm going to make sure of it. You guys, I'm really, really concerned about his family. I feel like that's going to be really, really bad. Like, I, you know, he's out here promising things. And depending on how much info they were able to get, they may have already grabbed these people up. So... He tells her the whole story and she says, I never liked EO. Not for you. She could be manipulative. She kept some things from you. I know about the child. I say, I know what she told Dio on the scaffold. Mother scoots closer to me, her hands grasping mine and bringing my knuckles to her lips. She never gave much comfort. She's awkward at it now, but I don't mind. Father loved her for the same reason I do. Everything she does, she means. There's no falseness to her, no deception. So when she tells me she loves me, I know she means it with every part of her. Eo was not a cruel girl. You know that. She loved you with everything she had, and I loved her for it. But I always feared she'd make you fight her battles. And I always feared how much she loved to fight. And I love that. I really do. Like, I'm not trying to say Darrow wasn't in a better position to lead this fight. Because, like, from what I've seen, a woman wouldn't have been able to do it 
because she wouldn't be allowed in the places he'd be allowed. Like just the, the kind of privilege he has being male. It's just, was going to place him in a different position than she could ever reach. But the fact that she like left him with that, the way she did was fucked up. And the fact that she kept to herself, that she was pregnant extra fucked up and it just remains maddening to me that he isn't more angry with her about that. Um, but anyway, he says, I can lead us out of here. And she says, to where? To the surface? Where we'll do what? All we know is the mines. All we know is how to dig, how to harvest silk. If what you say is true and there are hundreds of millions of reds on Mars, how will there be enough homes for us up there? How will there be enough work? Most won't leave the mines. Even if they know, you'll see. They'll just stay miners. And their children will be miners. And their children's children, except the nobility, will be lost. Do you think about these things? Of course I do. And do you have an answer? No. Men. Your father was one to jump without looking. Hell divers all think they provide for the clans. No. The women do. Everything you see, made by a woman. But you know how to shape the world, don't you? Know what it should be. No, I don't. I say, I'm not the one with the answers. Mustang is. Eo was. Mother is. No one man or woman has all the answers. A thousand a million bright minds will need will be needed to answer what you've asked me. That's the point of this. What I can do, what I am good at, is tearing down the men and women who would keep those minds shackled. That's why I'm here. It's why I exist. And he asks, do you think it's possible to love two people but they get interrupted by Dio coming down the stairs and he uses his ghost cloak so that she can't see him. And, uh, when her, when the little one is like, who were you talking to? She says, I was saying a prayer for your uncle. Um, the dead can always hear us. Why else do you think we sing? We want them to know that even though they are gone, we can still find joy. That's all they'd want for us. So I thought that was a really nice meeting and a great conversation. Um, I, I, I like the fact that one might think going to meet your mother after having started a revolution like this and telling her the instrumental role that you have played, you would expect probably for her to be more like, I knew you would do this. You'll free us all. And I really kind of enjoy that she's sort of like, Oh God, kid, what are you thinking? This is not going to go the way you think. Like, it just makes sense to me. She'd react that way. So he goes outside and he's just devastated at the fact that Mustang has gone. Um, Ragnar and Severo both hail me. I don't answer their calls. They want me, they'll want me to give orders to shoot her down. I won't. I can't. So then he hears this sound, this chiming sound, because he's trying to like find Mustang and it chimes behind him. A scorcher battery pack whines as it activates and warm yellow light blossoms behind me, illuminating a swath of the large tunnel. Hands where I can see them. Her voice is so cold, I hardly recognize it till it echoes back to me from the tunnel walls. And she is holding a scorcher and she's got a light in one hand. Her knuckles are white. Her face is an impassive mask and behind it, two eyes filled with fathomless sadness. Now, Here's my, so you guys know, I was asking at the start of this, how did Adrius find out? And there's a part of me that wonders if this is Adrius here. And I know that sounds fucking paranoid, but we did see 
that there are masks they can make that are digital that are very, very convincing. And she is standing away from him, shining a light in his eyes. And it's just possible when she says, like, I made sure the tracker left without me, that that's not what happened. And that there was, like, a, a you know, an understanding that some shit would happen. But I don't know if that makes any sense because it's not like later on the two of them are fine. She is still not talking to him and avoiding him and stuff. So that feels like it matches up with this conversation having happened, but I'm not going to lie to you guys. It has occurred to me because there's just so much that technology can accomplish in this universe short of actual teleporting apparently. Um, so we get to hear about like how Severo was certain she would kill him. And, uh, it's sort of occurring to Darrow that maybe Severo was more right than he was about her. And he explains everything. And I love when he just starts to ask, why did you come back? And she says, no, you answer my questions. She's just like, don't you dare. And she has an interesting reaction about like finding out everything that happened with his wife and how he died. And it's just like, my father killed your wife. How can you even look at me? Which that's a valid question. You know, she also has a really hard time with the fact that Titus was also a red and is just immediately like that's what you want to happen and he has to try he explains to her i was ready to go in the tightest direction i was surrounded by people who have enslaved mine and i wanted revenge and then you showed up and you showed me that golds are people and that they can change as well and he keeps stepping toward her and she finally gets down to it. And it's just like, these people are my family and you want me to what help you destroy all of this. And he says, I don't want genocide. And she says, yeah, you do. And I don't even really blame you. Like after all of this, how can I live with this? If I don't pull the trigger, millions will die. If you pull it, you accept that billions should live as slaves. And fucking Ragnar shows up and he really like he startles her so bad. And she's like, oh, wait, he knows he fucking knows, too. Wow. And Ragnar, when he's being given orders to not hurt her, basically he's starting to do his own thing. Like, dude, you were the one who told me that I don't have to just mindlessly obey you. And I think this one is going to be a problem. So I'm going to do what I think needs to happen. Because no offense, I trusted you once before. And you were very, very, very wrong. And Mustang says, see, you start this war, it'll be beasts like him who finish it and take their revenge. And he is trying to say that's not what this is. It's not even meant to be revenge. And she's like, come on, that is stupid. You know that that is so idealistic. You can't believe that everybody is going to be able to. And he's like, we have to trust that people are going to be better than that. Um, Mustang stomps out her own lamp. No light, no color, but darkness. The silence is deeper than the tunnel. It meanders through the heart of Mars, stretching forever, echoing to places only the lost have ever been. And... 
she, this is when Ragnar says, I live for my sisters. I live for my brother. I am and always have been son to the people of the Valkyrie Spires. And he describes all of the scars and where they have come from all over his body. For gold, I have buried three sisters, one brother, two fathers. But for them, I have never earned a scar. Now I live for more. Ragnar closes his eyes, putting himself at the mercy of a gold, having faith like I have faith, like Eo had faith in me, like Severo and Dancer and all the rest. What do you live for? I ask. And then the chapter ends, and we don't get an immediate wrap-up. We find out later that she just walked away from him, because we have jumped forward in time. And we're in the midst of this whole uh, parade, I guess, is what you would call it, um, that is meant to be like the initial celebration of the new rulership that's going to be taking place at Mars. And <laughs> there is this moment where Roke is whispering in his ear, you are but a mortal, as if to remind him. And I can't help but see that as a much more sinister statement now than I did at the time. And Daryl, all he can think about is how much he wishes Mustang were here. I, I'll tell you what, kids, I'm just realizing, and I don't know, it's possible that Mustang told Adrius. I don't think so, though. I'm going to acknowledge it. I'm going to acknowledge it as being like an option. But she mistrusted him so completely. I just don't see it. If she had this information and she really didn't want to follow Darrow, I could see her giving this info to somebody else. I don't know who, but he's just not the one I think she'd go to. I don't know who, what she'd do though. You know? So at this point, I just really don't think that's how he found out. I have to assume he got info during torture and it just was not like the rescue didn't happen in time. Um, so, the, the the whole thing here when he's like, F Fitchner is not here. He should be. I look for him at the top of the colossal white stairs that lead to the Citadel grounds. And I should have started to worry about that already. I'm like, I, I sh um, there's so many spots where like looking back, I'm thinking, Jesus, this should have been a fucking sign. I saw plenty of the signs, but not all of them. Um, so accept this laurel as our proclamation of your glory. She sets it upon my head. Severo snorts beside me. I really enjoy every like reminder we get that his friends are around thinking that this is sort of funny. It's not that they don't respect him or acknowledge that he's capable of crazy shit, but it's just the ceremony and the pomp of it. And I keep thinking about just like figures, you know, maybe Achilles, for example, that there were probably people around him that were like, that guy? Oh my God, what a pain in the ass. Um, but there's this long speech and it just takes fucking forever. And when it finally ends, everybody is like, thank God. And this is when Augustus takes him away to speak to him privately and he fucking gets so paranoid about Augustus before realizing like where they're heading is the throne room. And then he starts laughing. I just was like, dude, I can't like this. It just, for me already feeling like something was, was wrong, vaguely wrong, not having a lot of, of insight here, but just this was the last person I was worried about. You know, I felt like Darrow, you should be on your guard like this, but he isn't the one. Why would he be there? He has nothing to gain by taking you out at this point. Um, so this is when he says, you gave obsidians razors. You broke the law. What the hell are you doing? And he asks Darrow, 
He says, my father taught me it is weak to ask others what they think of you, but I must. Do you think I am a cold monster? I turned to examine him, without a doubt. Honesty. You'd think it would echo differently than all the other horse shit. What I am, Darrow, is a necessity. I am the force that corrects those who err. Tell me, why do you give an obsidian a razor? Why do you urge low colors to rise up? Why do you let a blue run your ship when she should merely take orders and fly it? Because they do things that I cannot. He nods as if I've proven his point. And that is why I exist. I know that blues can command fleets. I know obsidians can use technology, lead men, that the quickest orange could, if given a proper chance, be a fine pilot. Reds could be soldiers or musicians or accountants. Some few, very few, silvers could write novels, I wager. But I know what it would cost us. Order is paramount to our survival. Humanity came out of hell, Darrow. Gold did not rise out of chance. We rose out of necessity, out of chaos, born from a species that devoured its planet instead of investing in the future. Pleasure overall, damn the consequences. The brightest minds enslaved to an economy that demanded toys instead of space exploration or technologies that could revolutionize our race. They created robots neutering the work ethic of mankind, creating generations of entitled locusts. Countries hoarded their resources, suspicious of one another. There grew to be 20 different factions with nuclear weapons. 20, each ruled by greed or zealotry. This is one of those things that I feel very mixed about. Because... Saying, like, the economy demands toys, it really sort of makes it sound like the people themselves are to blame for everything that happened. And y'all know how I feel about that sort of thing. If anything, I feel like toys are being peddled to us to keep us from noticing the bullshit. And so it feels like there is a blame being laid at the feet of like the common people when really this was calculated by those who were in power to remain in power and to continue to hoard their wealth. You know, countries hoarded their resources suspicious of one another. Frankly, the the hoarding of wealth by just a few individuals feels like a much bigger problem to me. And I think that's sort of like the, the issue that I have with the way I am willing to believe like, yeah, uh, pleasure overall, damn the consequences. I am not trying to say that we aren't pleasure seeking as human beings. I am not trying to say that, we will do what's more comfortable most of the time. But I am, I I want to push back against the suggestion that like, well, we could have put that money into space exploration, but everybody wanted a PS5. No, the government is pouring money into armies instead of, space exploration or ocean exploration, which I also feel like should be a much bigger priority than it is. Our governments are allocating money to go to places that the majority of people, and I'm talking about the U S specifically here, don't want it to go to, but because our whole like system of government is set up in such a way that certain people can maintain a stranglehold on the Senate and the bills that pass, that means that what the majority want doesn't matter in the end. 
the majority of people in the United States, they support the, the right to choose. But you don't see that reflected in our government. The majority of people, there are a lot of reforms that are widely supported. And those things are not being put forward because there is a group of a small group in charge keeping those things from happening. So this paragraph, it could be that he has been given the wrong information about things. And I meant to read this as somebody who is coming from a place of misinformation, but I don't think that's really what's happening. I think this is the author trying to describe our present world from the perspective of somebody like him in the future. And I think it's a really blinkered, privileged, condescending viewpoint that isn't supported by facts. And it feels like the kind of thing that some edgelord would say in a comment section, thinking that they're really fucking like getting at it. And they're not actually addressing what's really at the root of everything. And I, that's just like, I, I won't lie. It influences the way that I see what he is writing from here on out. This is going to be in my mind a little bit. And that's not to say that it's going to make everything bad, but it just feels so not just short sighted, but it feels like he's fallen for an okie doke a little bit. Like, you know what I'm saying? It just, this is the sort of talking point that I think would get brought up by some shitty centrist who's trying to act as if the left is just as terrible as the right and talk about like, oh, well, all of human nature is just destined for terrible things because humans are innately flawed and they think they're saying something really profound. And actually, if things were a lot more evened out than they are, it wouldn't have wound up that way. But the fact is that there's plenty of us who are willing to invest in the future. There's plenty of us who would like to be doing something about fossil fuels, who would support a lot of changes in the way that we run our economy, our government. There's a, like the majority of us in the United States support doing things like that. And we're not allowed to get what we want because despite allegedly being a democracy, we're really not actually set up that way. So anyway, I just had to address that because it just, it feels like the elephant in the room for me. Um, so he says, when we conquered mankind, it was to save our race. And the whole thing comes down to the universe doesn't notice us. There's no supreme being waiting to end existence when the last man breathes his final breath. Man will end. That fact is accepted, but never discussed, and the universe will continue without care. I will not let that happen, because I believe in man. I would have us continue forever. And Darrow is realizing this dude genuinely believes what he's saying. It's not about whether something is the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. It's whether that thing will lead to the out come he wants. He considers himself above right and wrong. Those things are just not part of his universe because what his job is, is to ensure the continuation of the human race, which means that he doesn't need to engage with conscience or empathy. That's just not, a, that's not going to be helpful to his aims. And uh, he says, what about what you said and the things that you've done? You say you're trying to save humanity, but you're embracing a civil war. And he says, I do what I need to protect the greater good. And he talks about how 
the society is already weakening and that the sovereign is just like, you know, she killed her fucking father. Like she's a, a bad person to have in leadership hanging on to power the way that she is. And all of this is pointing us, it's putting us down the road that we have been trying to avoid and people like me will stop that from happening. And this is when he says, I want a son. And the one that I have, he doesn't have a plan for the kind of power I hold. He wants it, but he's a parasite. Uh, remarkably, this was his idea. You have his blessing. And I was like, yeah, you should really be wondering about that. Like, it's clear it, he does a little but not as much as he should. Um, so then there's the moment where he says something about reformers. And when Darrow is like, well, Mustang thinks that you're serious about that. He's like, I don't care. Like, as soon as Octavia is down, the reformers are going to jail or will kill them. They are absolutely not part of this. There is no way we are allowing that to happen. And you can say that she won't forgive me, but you'll be part of our family and you will convince her. And you'll make her come around to seeing things from our point of view. Um, but you must always be mine, answering to me, not my children. And he agrees and says, as you will it, my liege. But he says, call me father. And then we go to the scene. <sighs> you guys, I don't even know how much I want, because I've talked about so much of this. It's, I feel like I've pretty much gone over it. But I not not quoting it. So I'm just going to see if I can find some like spots here. Um, Victra turns up and Victra, I believe, is dead. She makes such an effort to let Darrow know she didn't know about this plan. And it's so wild to me because like, girl, you just got shot in the spine twice. I don't think anybody thinks you knew about this plan. Like, I wasn't worried about it. It was very clear that they went after you because they see you as one of his people. So the fact that she's so concerned that he knows that she didn't take any part in this, to me, it's just evidence of how much she genuinely cares about Darrow. Despite playing it off as a flirtation, joking around, I think she is kind of desperate for him to understand and believe in her. And there was something so heartbreaking about her, like dragging herself over to him as she's dying to tell him, I didn't know. Um, this is when Severo comes up to him and is like, Fitchner isn't here. He's not answering. Something's wrong. And they, he goes off with Ragnar. Um, so Augustus comes forward and he starts his little speech and everything um, and Roke then begins his speech. You and I have seen much together. The night I first met you, you were on the floor of Mars Castle looking at the blood on your hands. Do you remember what I said? Of course. If you're thrown into the deep end and do not swim, you will drown. So keep swimming. How far we've come. I would have paid a hundred times what your contract was worth to protect you. I know, Roke. I would have died for you a thousand times more because you were my friend. Were. Something in his voice makes me look around. Over his shoulder, I see Victor whispering something humorous to Antonia and their skeletal mother. Morn serves his grandchildren little plates of cake brought by a short pink. But it's after the server turns that I freeze inside. He turns haughtily ruthlessly, unlike any pink ever born, breaking character only for half a second, 
I know that turn. I know that man. It's Vixus. It has to be. My eyes dart to the pink who brought me Lorne's whiskey. Lilith. I pull back from Roke, about to shout, when I feel his grip tighten and I realize he was saying goodbye. A needle from his ring pricks my wrist, gentle like the kiss he now plants on my cheek. And thus go liars with a bloody damn kiss. One word shatters a thousand lies. And you guys, even though he said bloody damn, I was so preoccupied, I didn't even notice that right away. Because I've reread this section like four times now. So just the first time listening to the audiobook, that like sailed over my head. And then he opens the box's lid with the gentle creak of silver hinges, my world ends. Augustus gasps in horror at what's inside the box. And a foot away, the jackal, eyes full of long, dormant hate, smiles at me and cocks his head back like an animal to loose a manic, mocking howl. (sighs) So, he's been poisoned, he's paralyzed, he falls to the ground as shit is going on off everybody is pulling blades and killing people in the crowd and the the whole like lauren's death especially after not wanting to get involved in this is so devastating um and this is when uh there's a cassius says virginia missing i fear the jackal says warned angered Lover spat. <sighs> can he move, poet? No, but he can hear. You killed my family, Darrow. All of them. Me, Julian? That's one thing. But the children? How could you? I don't know what he's talking about. Yeah, Cassius, that sounds like the jackal did that. I'm just guessing. But if there was something that particularly set you off, I would guess he's behind it. And that becomes more likely as things wrap up between Adrius and his father. <sighs> um, oh, yeah, this is the part that I was sort of... Uh, so... The jackal says, a moment, if you please. Augustus lies pinned to the ground by three waiters. They hoist him up as the jackal approaches, stepping over Lorne's desecrated body. Is the mask not as you like, Darrow? I made it just for you after you revealed your true self to me in Attica. What is Attica where they had that meeting where the bomb went off? Did he know then? Has he known this whole... Is that what he's saying? Because I think that was part of where I got this misapprehension that that maybe it wasn't Mustang that he had told a story to down there. But I have to think when he says in Attica, I don't remember where that is. So I'm feeling like I missed something there. Um, Ashley says I always find Victor to be heartbreaking here because she clearly is loyal to Darrow but is terrified she's going to die with Darrow believing she was part of the betrayal against him yes Cassie says Attica is when Darrow brought gifts and Ashley says yes Attica is the jackal's home okay so Revealing his true self in Attica was him faking fighting back to stop these people. And he clearly was like in on it with them. So that was, was it maybe a test? I don't remember. We don't find out what Darrow gave Adrius as a gift, do we? He opens the box, says you shouldn't have, and then we get interrupted. And as far as I recall, we don't go back to that. But revealed your true self, it's got to be that he just 
the fact that they shoot at me and they all miss and I shoot at them and they, I miss every time. That was what made it clear that some shit was up with him. Because he, he doesn't say after you were revealed to me. He says you revealed your true self. So maybe that's what he's talking about. Because I, I thought that whole thing was just fucking weird. Um, so at this point, Augustus, first he calls him a monster and is just like, what the fuck are you doing? And then he says, my son, you've ruined us. And I was like, oh, now you call him son? And then immediately, Adrius is like, oh, now you call me son? And I was like, shit. And it turns out he was behind Carnus's death. I don't remember if I ever theorized that this was a possibility. But if I never did, I'm a fool. I should have known. I really should have. It's like completely in line with who he is. You know, I just, you know, I, I just think that I didn't consider the ages of everybody involved and whether or not <sighs> he was 10, you know? So like I should have probably, if I ever like did the math, I probably would have said he was too young and he wouldn't have done it. But this dude's a fucking nightmare. So 10, yeah, I believe it. And his father, I mean, the way Augustus reacts, he truly had no inkling. And it's obvious when this is said to him that this fucking breaks him. Like, the idea that this was done on purpose to give Adrius a chance to prove himself and it still was never enough. Everything he did, he is trying to prove that he can be ruthless as much as anybody, that he can do what his father wants. But it's too much. You know, his father wants somebody who is cold and Adrius isn't cold. He's manic. He's heated. He's enjoying things too much. And that's not the kind of control Augustus values in people. So it makes sense how the way he behaved, despite thinking it was what his father wanted, it simply wasn't. And he also says, was I your son when you put me on a rock for the elements to claim me? Three days, I was a baby. The board didn't even want an exposure, but you thought I was so weak. And I don't know if we knew about this. I don't remember if it's been mentioned. But I guess three days, he was like, okay, well, if he's still alive, I guess we'll keep him. But that's wild. And yeah, he says like, oh, by the way, uh, I paid Carnus to kill him with money you lent me because you thought when I said invest in my future that I was going to buy fucking shares. Like a, a 10 year old gives a shit about shares. I cannot believe how easy it was. And finally, it, Augustus just says, you are not my son. And he's like, well, okay then. And he shoots him in the head. And Aja is very upset. <laughs> she says, you dumb little snake. The sovereign needed him to talk down the outer rim. Gory, damn it. And the jackal's like, I got you fucking Darrow. So quit it. I don't want to hear it. And I was sort of like, I see that. I kind of see his point there. And then he mentions the Telemonuses are coming. Unless you want to play with them, I suggest we leave. They come pick me up off the ground. Victra's hand on my leg slackens. Her eyes have closed. And he says to Roke, brother, you are a son of red. I am a son of gold. The world where we are brothers is lost. And in this world, the power of gold will never wane. 
and we find out that the head is Fitchner's eyeless mouth stuffed with grapes. Aries, the one hope we had, the one man who picked me up when I was broken and gave me a chance for something better than revenge, has been butchered. And I know we are undone. And that is the end of the book. I am so, so very over time. So I have got to stop and wrap. But you guys, oh man, I'm starting the next book right away. I mean, that's a given. But I don't get to talk about it until Tuesday. So that sucks. But what can you do? Oh, God. Cassie says, as Ashley said, we love you. Yeah, sure you do. You sick fucks. (laughs) Oh, God. Cassie says, I mean, if you want to do an impromptu thing. Oh, you mean like record? Yeah, no, I don't have time to fit anything else in. I would consider it. I, I confess. But yeah, I may, uh. I may do another TikTok, so keep an eye on that if I do read ahead and it's like something I need to say right away. So that's the only thing, though. All right, kids, I'm going to wrap again. Thank you so much. Appreciate you all. And until next time, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.